3 p.m. You mind if we go ahead and get started, everybody? Let's do this. I know we have a few more stragglers coming in, probably, so we'll just uh, make some introductions real quick on today's tips for being effective and calm. For those of us that need this, we will be listening intently. I'm Brett Augustine, your recovery visit business advisor for North Central Texas Small Business Development Center. And uh, which is, by the way, a leading provider of assistance for small businesses. We are grant funded, which allows us to offer our services at no cost to you. And it allows us to bring to you presentations with high quality, such as the one you're going to do today. Uh, this particular presentation, Tips for Being Effective and Calm, is presented by Lorna Kibbe. We're happy to have her back today. If you would please leave your uh, questions in the chat box so that afterwards we can go over them with Lorna and she can keep on a roll and keep us calm all the way through to the very end so that we can ask our questions in a calm and effective manner by that time. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Miss Lorna Kibbe. She's an ASBDC conference speaker. She's also been 10 years experience working at the SBDC Florida Gulf Coast University. And she is a leadership expert, and you're about to find out exactly why. With that said, I'd like to introduce Ms. Luna Kibbe. Thank you, Brett. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to our communication series. Today is a great topic, presentation tips. Being effective, being calm. Oh, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if we can get that up here and make that work okay. You guys can tell me if you can see it just fine. And we'll see how how we doing. Do we have it? You can see that nervous guy peeking around the corner and you can relate, right? <laughs> okay, here's an interesting thing I found in USA Today. Can you believe this? 52% of office professionals when surveyed admitted that they turned down a career opportunity because they felt like they weren't good enough at public speaking. Can you imagine? I, turned down a career opportunity because they didn't feel like they were good enough at, at speaking. That kind of shows you how important it is in the minds of, of people, especially considering the fact that you've probably heard this, that over 90% of the population in the United States says that they fear speaking in front of an audience more than death. I can't even imagine that. <laughs> I can't even imagine. <laughs> more than 90% say they fear speaking in public more than death. Wow. So it seems like this is a pretty good subject to take on, right? This is something we can talk about. We can give you some tips for helping you to make effective presentations and to maybe lose those nerves a little bit. It really is possible. You know, by now, if you've been on any of my sessions, I always like to start with the definition. So let's talk about the definition of a presentation. What I usually find out is when I look at these definitions, it's the scope of things is just much wider than I really thought in my brain sometimes, you know, like this. Okay, a formal talk made to a group of people, often with handouts, diagrams, or other visual aids. All right, yep. The act of making something publicly available, presenting news or other information. Wait, because that's, I was fine with the formal talk, but now when I look at number two, it's like, making something publicly available, presenting news or other information, that seems a whole lot wider. I mean, if I'm presenting news, like if I'm talking to you and presenting news to you or just sharing with you something that I read, or in, in essence, according to the definition, is that a presentation? Yeah, it kind of is. And that should make you feel good because a presentation doesn't have to be this big formal thing that you think of when you think of presentations, right? As a matter of fact, when you're the one delivering information, you're selling the process, you're explaining how things work, you're giving instructions, or talking in front of any number of people, you're making a presentation. It's just that simple. So there's a lot we can talk about to help you to feel more comfortable in making those presentations. What I've decided to do today to try to help in this, this short time that we have to talk about it is to break it into three steps for you. And those three steps are this, first, developing the content, Second, designing the presentation. And third, actually being in front of the audience, delivering the message. I'm wondering if you would do me a favor and share with me in chat, which one of these gives you the hardest time 
when you look at these three steps, which one gives you the hardest time? Is it actually developing the content, like figuring out what you're going to include, what you're going to say, and what order you're going to say it, you know, and, and what should be presented? Or is it designing the presentation, like, okay, how do I get it out there? What, what visual aids do I include? Do I give a handout? How do I put the topic together so that people will understand me? Or is it that dreaded part of just being in front of people? So which of those three? Uh, let me see. I got to find my chat screen. Oh, here we go. Let's see if I'm get, getting some answers. All right. Developing content, delivering the message. Okay. Somebody just put in design and we got this all covered. <laughs> okay. So, oh, yeah, I got a lot of deliveries now. I see a lot of delivering the press up. Oh, thank you for the design. There we go. <laughs> content versus pretty. Yeah, that's a good point. That's why I love that. We're going to talk about that. Okay, so it looks like we need all of this information, so we can't just skip to number three. We're gonna we're gonna talk about all of it. <laughs> no problem. All right. So three steps. Sometimes PowerPoint surprises you. You know, look at this animation. I wasn't expecting that. How could that happen? It does happen, <laughs> and things like that can really throw us off topic. Let's start with developing content. Okay, step one: developing the content. Here are some things to look at when you're developing your content. The very first thing above all is to clarify your purpose. Now, I know that sounds simplistic, but have you ever been in a presentation where somebody's just all over the place with what they're talking about and you're not even sure what the point is? <laughs> yeah, I've been there too. So making sure that you define your purpose. The mistake that some times people make when they're trying to put together a presentation is they try to include way beyond the point of the whole thing. They try to include so much stuff that it's just not even possible. And instead of giving a clear message, we get all this hodgepodge of stuff that leaves us wondering what, what just happened, right? So making sure that you're very clear with what your purpose is. Exactly what is my point in making this presentation? Honestly, if you can't tell me what is your point in making this presentation, then don't make the presentation. <laughs> I need to understand exactly what you're trying to do. So the purpose is first. And then once you, you define your purpose, start with what you know. And what I mean by this is take some time to sit back and just really think about, okay, what do I know about this topic? You probably know a bunch of stuff, or if you don't, then I'm not sure why you're being asked to present this and you've got a lot of work to do. But think about everything that you know, and just start making some notes. So start with what you know, and then start your research, okay? Because once you define what you know, then it's easier for you to kind of see what's missing, what the gaps are that fit with your purpose, and what you need to do some research on. The truth is, when you're putting together a presentation for someone for the first time where you're de just developing it yourself, you're gonna have way more stuff than you can include in the presentation. But that's good because somebody will probably ask you that question and you'll be ready. <laughs> so do your research and from there, develop your main points. Okay, so I've got like 10, ten things. Paula was that, are, are you guys hearing me okay? I just saw, okay, I just saw a message from Paula and I thought it was for me, but I don't think so. She told me to go away and never come back. Or maybe she was telling me to come back anyway. <laughs> Okay, so your main points. Now that you've looked at all this information, done some research, pull out three or four, four bullet points. The best structure for any presentation is you're open, your three main things, and your close. All right, that's all it is. So maybe you have five main things, your five main points. But develop that outline at this point. Open, what do I have to tell them first? What are the three or four or 16 main points? Kidding, it should, shouldn't be that many. <laughs> Three or four main points, and then your close. So just develop your main points and then put that together in an outline. And that's the beginning of developing your content. That's where you want to start. Once you've done that, you have to figure out how to organize it, right? How, in, in what order should you present your main points? And there's a lot of tips for this. Um, this picture, for those of you that can see the screen, this is actually a picture of the slides for this presentation printed out one at a time. And they are on a cork board where I stood there and moved them from this to that and from that to this. 
trying to figure out what order I wanted the slides to be in to make sure that the content was presented in logical order. So that's one way to do it, but you have to line things up so that they're logically presented. And, and there's different ways you can organize. You can do it in time. Like, let's say that you wanna talk about the three major events that led to World War I. So that might be a time order situation where you're gonna say, first this happened, then this happened, and then World War I. Or maybe you wanna use a topic order, like the major duties of the President of the United States. So you wanna pull out the three major duties of the presidency and talk about those. Or maybe you want to do um, a problem solution. You know, here's the problem. Um, here's a pro proposed list of solutions and here's the best one, something like that. So think logically about how you're gonna be able to convey the information so that two things happen. First thing is, is that it's logical in your head because that means that when you go to present it, you're gonna remember it, okay? If, it's log if it makes logical sense to you, then it's gonna be a lot easier for you to be natural in what you present. And the second thing that's gonna happen is your audience is gonna be able to follow you and understand what your presentation is about and how it all adds up and have a better chance of actually remembering what you said. So think about what's the clear and logical way to present that information. As you're doing that, don't forget your transitions. You need to make sure that your transitions are smooth, that you're moving from one thing to another with a little bit of finesse, you know, so that it makes sense. It's like if you have three major things and you present the first one, and then all of a sudden you're talking about the second one. Give me a transition to that second one. Give me a story, give me some kind of transition, at least a slide that says, here comes number two. <laughs> so do, do some kind of transition so that it's, the content is smoothly connected as you go. And don't forget, less is more. As I said, many times people will just try to present way too much information. I really have to work on cutting down content. Um, and if we're on until six instead of 4.30, then you'll see I did a bad job. <laughs> Hope not, just kidding. <laughs> so you really have to pare down your content because it's, a, it's an absolute no-no to go past time on a presentation. You have to stay within your time. It's better to have too little content than too much. Many times what I find is when I think, oh boy, I don't, I don't have enough content for this. I probably should add more. By the time I allow, allow for some audience, audience interaction, my time is just sucked up. And that's a big difference in virtual and in person. You know, in virtual, like in an hour and a half, you can't believe how much stuff I can say if you don't talk back to me. But in a live situation, I wouldn't be able to say nearly as much as what I'm saying in this virtual presentation because I would want you to interact. I would want you to be a part of it. So in person is really different from virtual. So you got to think about how you're doing your presentation, how much time you have, and just make sure if you have to go one way or the other, go with too little. I don't think I've ever had anybody complain because I ended early. But go late, it's over. <laughs> Here's a big thing to think about. Who are you preparing for? You really have to think about your target audience. It, you can't just go in and then start delivering stuff until you think about who you're presenting to. That's going to give you a lot of guidance as to what to include. You know, who's, who's going to be in the audience? How much do they already know? I mean, if they already know a lot about your topic, then you really need to think about what you can skip. Or maybe they don't know anything at all, and it needs to be done at a very basic level. That's one of the things that I, I struggle with, especially trying to help new presenters, is trying to figure out where their audience is. Because if they can determine that, then they know where to go. You know, if you've ever been in on a presentation where it was just all too basic for you, you know what I'm talking about. Or a presentation where it was just way over your head. It means that the presenter didn't really do a good job of identifying the different levels that's going to be in their audience. And most of the time, that's what we have. We have a mixture of both. So thinking about that is really important. Um, if you have people in the audience who have done it before, but you still need to present at a basic level, that's cool because you can do things like use them to help lead discussion groups or, or use them to help answer questions. So there's, there's really room for all levels, but recognizing in advance that you're gonna have all levels or they're gonna have complete beginners, whatever. 
just try to be ready for that. So put some thought into that and never assume that your audience is going to be. Well, this is stereotyping, you know, everybody in here is going to be young. So I need to do this or everybody in here is going to be old or, you know, never stereotype, you know, assume what your audience is going to be like, because usually that results in you getting burned <laughs> because it doesn't turn out that way. So, yeah, don't jump to assumptions about who you think is going to be there. Remember this, that people have different communication styles. And if you've been sitting in on any, any of the communication uh, sessions that we've done, you know, I've talked about this every time is that people have different styles. Some people are very visual. Some people really pick up on the nonverbal. Some people really pick up on tone of voice. Um, some people are just really auditory and trying to listen to every word. So there are all different styles, all different communication styles and different learning styles. Although that's meeting with some controversy, but the truth of it is you have people in the room who really have visual skills where others are just listening and taking notes and, and others who like need to do it to understand it. It's important to know that when you're putting together your material, because you are going to have all of that going on in the room. And if I, I guess the best example I could give you is a college lecture. Been in on a, been to a college lecture, I imagine, right? And with a college lecture, it can get really boring <laughs> because they're not mixing it up at all. And we need to try to mix it up to appeal to all the different styles of the people in the room to keep them engaged and interested, which is a hard thing to do virtually. There are some platforms that lend themselves to that much better than the one we're on um, or what we're doing. So it's just something to think about. It depends on your topic, it depends on your audience, depends on how much time you have and what you can do to mix it up the best you can for your audience to keep everybody, everybody engaged if you can. Another thing to remember here is that this is about a transformation of knowledge. People get all caught up and worried about what should I wear? You know, what are they going to think of me? How do I look? <laughs> you know, what should I say here? You know, how do I sound smart? That's the wrong focus. The focus needs to be on the person in the audience. Everything that you need that you do needs to be about your person in the audience. And you have to keep that in mind when you're designing this, this entire thing when you're developing your content. Transform knowledge, focus on what they're hearing, not what you're saying. If you ever start to worry about, oh, am I saying the right things? Am I wearing the right thing? How am I doing? Just change that to, are they hearing the right thing? Are they saying the right things? Are they understanding? Because it's about the audience, not about you. Remember, these are adult learners. You know, on the chest, they may have a logo like this one right here. If you're looking at the slide, what it really should say is it should say, I know because they come in the room and they already know <laughs> they know a lot. And our job is to take what they know, all the experience that they have and transform that knowledge to help them use it in a new way. So don't underestimate who's coming into the room. There's a chance that they already know a lot and that's OK. And you know, there are people in my audiences all the time who know more, more than me. And what I've learned to do is, is use that to help me instead of being afraid of it because it's out there. There are all kinds of people in the room when you present. Step two of your three steps, designing your presentation. And some of you said, this is something you need some help with. This is something that takes a lot of thought how to design it. This is how you put it all together. And, and as someone said, you know, make it look pretty. And it's not just what you say. I mean, it's what you say, but it's also like what, what handouts will you use? What activities will you do? What visual aids will you use? Uh, what will your slides look like? It's, it's all of that. How do you make it visually appealing? How do you logically organize? How do you put it all together so that it makes a lot of sense for your audience? There are a lot of teaching methods and some of you probably know this because you've been in school before, but look at all these different things. You know, there's lecture, there's discussion, there's demonstration, there's questioning, there's simulation, there's e-learning, there's case studies, there's role play, there's video and on and on and on. There's all kinds of teaching methods in designing your presentation. You need to be checking things off this list as you go, because we know 
that people in the audience have different communication styles and different learning styles. We have to pay attention to using different methods to try to get our message across. So we don't want to be like the college professor who just lectures for a solid hour because we know we're going to lose people in that. I, one of my first college classes was a biology class where there were 400 people in the room and the professor lectured for the entire time of the class with no overhead projector, <laughs> PowerPoint slides, no anything, no visuals. I didn't do very well in that class. As a matter of fact, it, I'm really quite ashamed of how poorly I did, but it was because I'm the kind of person who needs the visual. You know, I need to be able to mix it up. I have a hard time with just, you know, I'm not as auditory to sit there and listen to a lecture for an entire hour and soak it all in. I need to take some notes. I need to do something that helps me to visually connect. And you need to do that for your audience. So look at these different things. And honestly, it's so easy to include these different things. As a matter of fact, it's, um, it makes it a lot better for you. Just take, think about like discussion. So you take a few minutes and you say, okay, everybody get in a group of two or three and discuss this question. <sighs> How nice. While they're doing that, you can take a breath. <laughs> And they can have a really good discussion. And this is how they learn. This is how they transform their knowledge. So let them have that discussion. Give them a few minutes to do it. And then when they come back, it's really simple for you. Okay, I want to hear a couple of highlights. What did you hear that just amazed you? You know, and, and take take what they have to say and, and use it to further extend your, your content. So discussion is such an effective tool. You have to be a good facilitator in this, and we'll talk more about that. It's like... Sometimes, you know, I have to really gauge, like, how long do I let this discussion go on? Because it could completely take over. But there's so much value sometimes that comes from those discussions mm -hmm. that I have to make a judgment how, how long to let that discussion go. But it's a really effective tool. Questioning, great technique. You know, just stop talking for a minute and ask a couple of questions. Has anybody out there ever experienced this? And let a couple of people give some comments about it. It breaks it up. It really engages people. You know, people are sitting there starting to go to sleep on you, hear a voice coming from over there all of a sudden, and they're like back, you know? So just a question, a simple question, bring them back in like that. Sometimes I'll, I'll do things like, okay, if this has ever happened to you, I want you to stand up. And people begin to stand up. You know, it gets a little energy on the room. Just have them stand up. or And, you know, uh, okay, if you're here, just sit down and Whatever you can do to get some energy going and keep people engaged in it. Case studies are great. Um, if you do case studies, actually with everything you're doing, just make sure it's really relevant to what you're doing. Uh, case studies are good because they, they work in environments where you have professionals who are doing common things, like I have a room full of, of healthcare workers. I just have to be careful that whatever case I use is, um, is matches their needs and mine, that I know enough to guide them through the case study and that uh, they have an opportunity to really discuss it and enjoy that discussion because that'll help them learn and really internalize content as well. So there's a, a lot of, of techniques that you can use and you, and you just really need to mix it up because it's all about making it stick. You know, it's, it's not just, you know, listening to me for an hour, but it's what you do afterwards. And that's, that's something I always try to talk to my audiences about is like, you know, this is great. You're here. Kudos. You're you're learning something. You know, you're helping yourself. But if you just end the call, you end the session, and you walk away and do nothing with it, then why did you waste your time? You know. But I have to help with that. <laughs> you know, I have to help. So as the facilitator, you know, think about ways that you can make your content really stick for your learners. And there are several things for that. Repetition is a big one. Um, in one of the sessions that I did on communication, I had a tagline that I just repeated over and over and over again because I, I wanted people to understand how content was put together on, in writing. Um, so maybe you have a line that you repeat over and over that's like the key purpose of the whole thing or the key point that you want to make. So repetition. Or, or, or with repetition, sometimes I'll stop and say, well, we're like moving fast, but I want to, I feel like I want to summarize this before I go to the next point. Can somebody summarize for me? Anybody willing to do that? There's always somebody willing to do that. <laughs> I 
you know, so that person speaks, everybody engages because of that. Somebody else will take a shot at it. Someone else will say, oh, yeah, and here's another point. You know, so all of those kind of things will really help to make it stick. Um, whatever you can do to get your audience to participate, that, that makes it stick. And those are some of the techniques I use for that. Stories are really effective. People re relate to stories. Use stories that, you know, are... are are uh, something they can relate to, something that they can take back. I'm surprised sometimes I hear people repeating my stories in the hallways, <laughs> yeah, because it's interesting and and it really relates to me. You know, I mean, I, it really relates to that person. They can they can they can understand what you're saying through stories sometimes or analogies. Those are really great. Um, let's see what else. Um, make sure your content is is vivid and, and simple. Uh, acronyms work great. You know, I'll say, here's the ABC method, put in, you know, find an A, a B, and a C word, <laughs> and that helps them to remember it. So whatever you can do to help them to be able to keep that content. Sometimes I give out a little card after the thing that has the acronym on it with the major points that I wanted them to, to take with them and I invite them to put it in their pocket, pull it out after the session and use it. I've even given out pins and buttons with the acronym on it. Anything you can do to help them pull the content back up and, and make it stick. Visual aids. You need visual aids. Everybody needs it. I went through a phase where I decided I wasn't going to use PowerPoint. <laughs> hey, Lorna, how'd that work for you? Well, let me tell you, it didn't work so well. <laughs> you know, I've heard so many bad things about PowerPoint. Death by PowerPoint. You know, we overuse PowerPoint. I'm like, you know, I can do a presentation now. PowerPoint, that's fine. So I, I did. I went in and quit using PowerPoint. The reason it was a mistake is because it cut out all my visual learners. All my visual learners didn't have anything to latch on to as I spoke, and I lost them. And I, I found out that wasn't very effective. They needed, they needed that visual. It was harder for me, too, because I didn't have like that guide to keep me in place, because PowerPoint does serve kind of as a guide to keep you on point and on target with where you're going with your presentation. So I, I put PowerPoint back in, but there are a lot of visual aids of the PowerPoint and all kinds of presentation software. And please know that when I say PowerPoint, I'm talking about all those other amazing presentation software packages that you like to use. It's just PowerPoint's like the word for all of them. <laughs> but I know there's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, any visual aid that you use, flip charts are great. Uh, the other day, I was uh, doing a, a Zoom, I was watching a Zoom presentation and I was really shocked because the presenter got up and behind him had, had a, a, a flip chart and they started writing on a flip chart. I hadn't seen that done before. It was so shocking and so interesting. I loved it, you know? Um, it was a little bit hard to see the flip chart. You know, that's what you're gonna think about. It's like, if I use a flip chart, can everybody see it? Usually in a lot of presentations, we can't see it, especially if there's very many people in the room. If it's a really small number, you know, where everybody can kind of gather around and see it, that's cool. If I need to use a flip chart and I have a larger audience and I know even, you know, even 25 people, somebody can't see a flip chart. What I do, believe it or not, is during the presentation, I ask everybody to get up and come over to the flip chart. And I place it, you know, somewhere away from all the tripping hazards place it over on the side of the room and say, everybody come up, let's go to the flip chart and talk about this. And I'll have everybody get up, walk over to the flip chart with me, and then teach from there. Gets them up, gets them moving, and they can see the flip chart. So things like that are really good to keep mixing it up and keep people moving. Pictures are great. Um, they really help people to relate. As a matter of fact, most of the PowerPoint shows that I do are, are picture shows. There's potential pitfalls with pictures and that they have to be really relevant to what you're talking about. And I tell the story. And if you've heard the story before, then you've heard me before because I tell us whenever I talk about presentations. One time I was talking about visuals in presentations and I was looking for a picture to put on the slide. I found a picture of a beautiful waterfall. I wanted to be there so bad. It was so beautiful. You know, it's just one of those pictures that makes you go, yeah, so I put it on my slide to talk about visuals and how beautiful they are, you know, and how to use them. And as I'm speaking, 
I hear two people in the middle the back of the room having a conversation and it's getting louder. You know, like it's almost it, it's getting to the point where it's distracting. And finally, I had to say, hey, uh, guys, <laughs> like you're having a big conversation back there. Do you have a question? What's going on? And one of the one of the uh, participants said, look, I've been there and I know where that is. And you're nuts. That is not North Carolina. That's in Italy. And they're having this big discussion about where this waterfall is. I was blown away because I didn't know where the waterfall was from. It was a free picture online, you know, and it had nothing to do with what I was talking about. Drew it completely off, threw me off, threw my focus off, threw my audience off, the whole thing. Everybody was laughing, you know, they were having fun with it. But then I had to take a break because we were so far off topic. So if you're going to use a picture, just make sure it's relevant to what you're talking about. Otherwise, it can go the wrong way on you. Graphs are amazing, right? Graphs can be so good if you can see them. Many graphs don't show up well on slides. So just be careful if you use a graph like on your PowerPoint slide. If, if I can't see the whole thing, if it's not perfectly clear, then don't do it. You're going to have to give it to me another way. Maybe a handout of just that graph. Anything on your slides that can't be seen from the back of the room and can't be seen clearly, it, it shouldn't be there. Videos are awesome, right? We're seeing so many videos. You may have noticed that this entire communication series, I'm not using videos. Why? Because there's so much fear of failure. There's such a high failure rate. Um, sometimes they work great. Sometimes they don't, depending on what system you have and whether there's a storm outside your windows, you may get it. Well, you may not. It may look choppy to you. It may not work at all. I can't risk it. Because if I do risk it, and even though it's a great video and it doesn't go well, it disrupts my presentation. It takes you off focus. It takes me off focus. I look like an idiot while I'm here trying to figure out how to do it. Even like in conference centers where, you know, they give us, they give us uh, internet access, I'll do it. <laughs> I don't do it because too many times it goes wrong. Great polling software. Have you seen that? It's so awesome. You just text on your cell phone. I don't do it. <laughs> Because all of those visuals have such a high possibility of failure that it, it derails your presentation. So really think about it. Now, I do have some videos that I use that are embedded into my slides and work perfectly every time because they're not dependent on the Internet. They're just embedded. That's fine if you can do that. But still, even embedded video, like if I'm doing a Zoom call, for some people it shows up choppy. So you just have to, to think about how you use these things. All these visuals are great, but only if they enhance your presentation instead of taking away from it. 3D objects, you know, if we were in person, what I'd love to ask you is, what's the one visual that you remember seeing in any presentation that, that you remember the most, you know? Because sometimes people come up with these amazing 3D objects that are like really useful and helpful. This one person, where I saw a presentation, she had a t-shirt and for each of her points, she would call up somebody from the audience and put this t-shirt on them that said the main point on it. And then they would sit in a chair. So the entire time you were looking, you, she was doing the presentation. Every time she added a main point, there was somebody sitting there with a t-shirt that had the main point. I was in the front. I could read the t-shirt. I'm not sure everybody could, <laughs> but it was still a pretty cool, pretty cool visual, you know, pretty interesting. Oh, and then one time I saw this guy doing this, Thing about science and he did some science uh sciencey stuff you know like with slime and things that was pretty interesting that went pretty well for the most part um, a few people got sprayed with soda in the front row but i'm sure they didn't mind anything that you're going to use just just be careful that you know what it's going to do and and how it's going to go over in a room can everybody see it can can everybody uh, understand it that kind of thing and then of course powerpoint slides which we will talk a little more about, did you know that PowerPoint was actually conceived in 1984? And at the time it was a two page proposal, a project proposal for a computer program to produce presentation graphics. It took six years for them to actually develop PowerPoint software. And in 1990, it came to be, and the rest is history, right? The thing we know is there's good PowerPoint and there's bad PowerPoint. Right? And you've seen both. 
bad PowerPoint. Let me show you a couple of examples. If you're looking at the screen right now, you're seeing this really cool graphic where there's directions and it gives you the directions. Turn left at the first street, turn right at the second street, and it goes on with like, I don't know, 20 different things on the list. It was all to make it to a, a vacant lot that was for sale. And be behind it, this is an actual slide that, that somebody showed me. Behind it, they had put a map behind the text, which looks kind of cool, but I can't see the text and I can't see the map. <laughs> that's, that's not good. And don't, don't do this. You know, this is not what we want to do. Limit your slides to three, if you can. Um, six is the max. I don't even like six. Three is better. Three is always better. So your bullet points, I say slides, limit your bullet points to three. You know, don't put too much text on your slides. I'll show you another poor example. Uh, this was in a presentation that I attended. This is an IT modernization roadmap. And oh my gosh, is it a mess? I'm sure it looks awesome on like a big poster board or something, but it's a mess for a PowerPoint slide. It's blurry. There's all kinds of strange colors. Did you know that a lot of men are colorblind? Um, there's arrows going everywhere. I, I couldn't even begin to figure out. Don't do that either. <laughs> oh, here you go. This is one for suggestions for teaching math. There's about 250 bullet points and it's blurry and the text is so small I can't read it. No, that's that's not how we use. That's not how we use PowerPoint. If I were to use this slide, this slide would say suggestions for teaching math and nothing else. And I would probably have a picture up there of somebody doing math. And then I would just have to talk about all those bullet points. The purpose of PowerPoint is not to have your speech written down on slides for you. <laughs> it's just to serve as a visual aid to the audience. So let me show you some good examples of PowerPoint. So if you can see the screen, great, you can see them. And if not, I'll talk you through it a little bit here. So here's a slide. This is a before and after. And this is a perfectly fine slide. It's the definition of communication. And it has this little picture of two people on a stairwell shaking hands and communicating. It's nice. There's a lot of clear space. Uh, the, the text is dark. It's, it's good. But let me show you what's better. This one. The same definition with a picture of people where the picture takes up the entire slide. That's cool. Communication. And what's happening here is each one of them has, there are four people and each one of them has a thought bubble with the major parts of the definition. So looks cool, right? Looks a lot better. See the before and after? So if you're using a picture, do your best to make the picture the entire slide and then just put in as much text as you need to make a, an easy point. Um, smart art. Just pause for a minute. Smart art. I don't know if any, those of you that use PowerPoint, if you've ever played with smart art, it is so cool. You have, if you haven't checked this out, you've got to go check it out. It's, you can see on my screen, I have a picture like of what the smart art menu looks like when you come up. And there's all these different things that are just already created for you. There are lists, there are processes, cycles, hierarchies, relationships, matrix, matrices, pyramids, pictures. There's just all kinds of charts that are pre-assigned and you can do so much cool stuff with those. So if you haven't used smart art, smart art, put this on your to-do list right now to look at after the session, go play with smart art. It's cool and it'll really help you to make nice slides. Here's an example of me using smart art. Okay. There are three steps for putting together a presentation, developing content, designing presentations, delivering your message. And as you can see, this is just a very nice slide. Three steps, not cluttered, not a lot of text. It's just beautiful. But using SmartArt, check this out. Very simple. It's still a beautiful slide, but we have a little bit more graphic on there, right? So you can see the before and after of how to use PowerPoint. Really be conscientious about how you're using PowerPoint and what your slides look like. I will tell you, and I'll confess, I love playing with the PowerPoint stuff, and I spend way too much time trying to make it look cool. <laughs> but um, I think it's worth it because it's the visuals that are important to my audience and I'm trying to make sure that my audience has the best experience. So here's just some helpful tips about PowerPoint in general to summarize. Limit the information on each slide. Honestly, um, 
on Zoom, like this kind of situation, there's probably more information on my slides than anywhere else. Like this slide right here has like a ridiculous amount of bullets. I think this slide has six bullets. That's like insane. I, I hardly ever do that. But on Zoom, sometimes it, it helps to have a little more. So again, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, consider a picture show. Like I said, a lot of my slides, especially when I'm presenting live, it's a picture with a heading and that's it. You know, like it'll say PowerPoint, have a picture of a PowerPoint slide and stop because it's up to me to, to deliver that content to you, not just in bullet points, but to tell you what's going on. Now, the nice thing for me is that when that slide comes up and I see that visual, it clicks for me and I know what I'm supposed to talk about there. That's a real benefit for the presenter. That's a good way to use it. Sometimes I don't try, I never try to memorize my content, but sometimes I try to memorize the order of my slides. Yeah, because if I can just remember what picture's coming next, that really keeps me on target with my content and keeps me from having to look at notes and such while I'm presenting because I know where I am. The visual brings it all back for me. So think about a picture show. Watch out for your colors and backgrounds. For the most part, you have to keep it simple. The, the thing that's difficult, especially I think, is that it doesn't look the same on a screen, like if you have to deliver on a, a presentation screen or even somebody else's like TV, you, you know, the, that kind of a screen doesn't look the same as it did on your computer. The colors are different. The backgrounds are different. Um, there was one place that I presented that had just bought a new projector and it was amazing. I mean, this thing must have cost a fortune. It was like really top of the line projector. And they also painted their wall. Instead of putting up a screen, they painted their wall with this special paint that you can buy now to project on, which was amazing it looks so cool they did a great job but the lighting in the room they didn't consider and when the projector was turned on and projected onto that really really bright wall that they had painted for the purposes of presenting it was so bleached out you couldn't see a thing the lighting in the room didn't allow it you know it was still this overhead fluorescent bulbs that was re reflecting off of the paint and you couldn't see it at all. It was really, it was embarrassing for them because they had spent a ton of money to make this really cool. And it was really cool. It's just, they didn't go far enough. <laughs> so I think, and, and the really unfortunate thing about this, the, the first presentation that I saw there was that the, the person who had designed the presentation did a lot of work with the colors to try to make it look nice. It happened to be October. And it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So they had made all of their text in pink for breast cancer awareness. You couldn't see a thing. Couldn't see a thing. <laughs> and it looked great on their computer screen, but you, could, you couldn't see a thing. So that kind of thing is fun to play with, but it's just, it just never really plays out for you in the real world. Always just stick with blue or black for your text and just keep your colors simple. Remember, too, I said, you know, a lot, a lot of men, especially, are colorblind. you got to be aware of that. Keep your font simple and large. I always recommend 32 minimum. A lot of times I even go bigger than 32, but 32 is the minimum for your font size. Um, if you're looking at the screen, just to give you a sample, I show you what a 32 aerial looks like, a 28 aerial, and a too small aerial, <laughs> which is still a good size, but it's not big enough. 32 at a minimum. And here's the last tip for you. Don't read your presentation verbatim. Have you ever been in a presentation where somebody's reading from their slides? It's like the worst. That that would make me fearful of presentations. <laughs> if I had to watch somebody do that, their back is to you, they're stumbling over their words. Never read your presentation verbatim. If you have to do that, you haven't prepared. You're not ready. You, you probably shouldn't be presenting. You know, that's not the way to do a presentation. So never read it verbatim. Okay, so that's a lot about, about PowerPoint. I guess I, I, I'm not really watching the chat, but it, is everybody doing okay? Any real burning questions right now? Keep going? All right, let's go. Handouts. Let's talk about handouts. When you do a presentation, a lot of time handouts are a part of it. And for me, they certainly are because it, it depends on my audience and what I'm doing, but people like something to take away. You know, they, they like if they have something to take away. Like with the format that we're doing here, you, you don't have that. You're forced to kind of do your own thing and, and you know, uh, take your own notes. 
but I have seen some Zoom presenters send out a, a handout in advance. Um, there's a few problems that we create with handouts. So let me, let me tell you what's on the slide and then talk a little bit more about that. First thing is, is we, we create several handouts and then we hand them out through the presentation. That's a big disaster. Never stop your class or your presentation to pass out handouts. Because if you're sitting there, and I know we've all seen this, while I'm sitting there, I'm, and I know handouts are coming around, am I listening to the presenter? No, I'm looking to see where are those handouts? Where's my hand? Are there going to be enough handouts? I'm probably, oh boy, I'll probably get the wrinkled handout and won't even be able to read it. Where are they? Who's got them? What's holding it up? I wish they'd hurry up, right? All this is going on, and I'm not listening to the presenter. So the worst thing you want to do is try to pass out. And I've seen people pass out one handout at a time through the whole presentation. If you have to use handouts, you pass out the whole thing. You put it all in one packet, do it all together. You either do it at the beginning or the end. If you have a whole packet, you feel like you've got it and you've got to do the handout form, you give it out at the beginning, don't put too much content in it. I know that sounds weird, right? But no, you don't want too much content. Remember, these are adult learners. You want them to write down what they're thinking, not what you're saying. Not what you're thinking. You want them to write down something that's going to help them going forward, not just what your thoughts were. I've done it both ways. And like if I do a writing class, I do like a 12 page handout with a lot of technical information in it because it needs to be that way because of what I'm teaching. But for most sessions, if I do a handout, it will be like a couple of main points on the topic with a whole lot of blank space for people to fill in their own notes and their own thoughts. So don't get carried away with content on handouts. The worst is to spend all this time creating handouts and all this energy to staple them and print them and make them look perfect and then watch people leave them on the table or throw them in the trash on their way out the door. <laughs> Yeah, so don't get carried away with handouts. Really think about whether they need to be done. One thing that you can do that I found to be effective is, you know, sometimes there'll be something that we really do want to give out, like a brochure or a pamphlet or something that we want people to have. Think about maybe giving it out at the end instead of at the beginning. And, you know, say you, there's a whole brochure on this, there's a pamphlet on this, I have a handout for you with all this technical information on it. I have a handout for you that have all the charts that we talked about as part of this presentation, and you can pick that up on your way out. That's cool, because if they really want it, they'll stop and pick it up. And if they don't, fine, you don't have to watch them throw it away. <laughs> so, you know, give them the option of picking up the handout or not. And on the slide, it says to be sure to proofread and double chuck. Yeah, and read is spelled wrong, too. Um, it's important to proofread your handouts or anything that you put out, your slides too, because uh, just it, it, it erodes your credibility if there are mistakes on your on your handouts or on your slides. And spell check is great, but if you spelled it Chuck instead of check, then spell check says it's just fine, right? So just be careful to to double check your documents. Maybe have somebody else look at them for you. Make sure they're right. Okay, all this and presenting, right? Okay, oh, this is a bonus I want to show you. This is awesome. This is something just for presenters. And I, I'm going to include this because I, I, a lot of presenters that I've talked to don't know about this. So I want to make sure you know about this because it's, it, it really is a great tool for me. As a matter of fact, it's a tool that I'm using right now. See, this is my notes. I don't use um, a lot of notes. But what I do is I do this. I use presentation notes from PowerPoint. Um, some of you can't see my slides, so I, I guess you can't see this either if you can't see the slides, right? Anyway, so here's what I do is there's a, a feature in PowerPoint that allows you to print it so that it looks like this. It has a picture of your slide, and then those notes that you put at the bottom are printed next to it. And it's, it's under export file, so it's in a strange place. Um, you go to publish, create handouts in Microsoft Word, and then select notes next to slides. So it's like under export, wow, it's like in a weird place. And if you need more help, let me know, I'll help you. But what it does is it creates a document that looks like this. It actually put, puts this into Word, 
and it, it looks like this. So the nice thing about this is that this is what I use for my study guide. This is what I use to read, like, just before I did the presentation, this is what I did to prepare. Pick this up and I read all of my notes because my notes tell me the major points that I want to make sure that I make because most of it's just pictures, right? Now, the top picture on here, too, is, is something I didn't talk about that I will, and it says PowerPoint slides as handouts. I decided to cut that slide at the last minute because I thought I might be getting carried away, but now that it's here, I better talk about it. Um, I don't, you know, you can go to PowerPoint and have it produce a handout for you. You've probably all seen that. It prints a slide, and then it prints like three blank lines, three or five blank lines next to the slide, and you can just give that as a handout to your participants. What a waste of paper. Don't do it. <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a terrible idea. And here's why I think it's a terrible idea. If you're doing your slides well, they don't have a lot of content, just like we just talked about. They're gonna have pictures and maybe the, the topic. They're not going to have a lot of bullet points. They're not going to have a lot of stuff on them. It's going to be a picture show mainly. So if you've done your slides well, people shouldn't really be able to gain very much from looking at those pictures of your slides, right? So what's the point of that? Now, if, you, if you're doing your slides and saying, you know, forget what Lorna says, I need to put all these bullet points on here. This is technical stuff. I got to list it and they need a, a picture of this so that they can make their notes. Well, have you ever tried to look at a slide that's done that way, that's this big, that has 10 bullet points on it? You can't read it. <laughs> Most of the time when you make the slides that small to print on this paper, just like you can see this on my screen even, you, you can't read it. So are you doing them any favors? So I just, I really disagree with using um, that feature of PowerPoint to produce slides. Just my opinion. I just don't think it's a good practice. If you're doing activities and we're still talking about how to design a presentation, make sure they're worthwhile. Make sure that they're relevant to your topic. I see sometimes in presentations, presenters do things to try to make it fun. Like they'll do a little game, you know, just to make it fun. To, let's get some energy going. Let's do something fun. If it's not related to the topic, I don't know about you, but it kind of burns my socks because I don't frankly have time to just be playing games. Now, if it's related to the topic, cool, I'm into it. You know, if it, if it demonstrates a point to me and helps me to see something that you're trying to teach me, something that you want me to take away, then it's awesome. But if you play a game just to play a game, so if you're going to do an activity, play a game, whatever, just make sure it's relevant to your topic. And also be careful that it's something that ever, everybody can do. I've had a couple of bad experiences where I tried to do an activity that I thought would just be really fun. One time I did this activity where I thought there's no way this can go wrong. It was a team workshop and I, I gave each team a challenge. I gave them a round circle of rope and I, I put the rope on the floor and their only job was to see if they could get the whole team member, all the team members to get their feet inside the circle. There's a tiny rope. They had big feet. How are they going to do this? And how are they going to figure that out? And so they're all playing with it. Well, the right answer to that puzzle, should I tell you? <laughs> the right answer to that puzzle is for everybody to sit down and put the rope around their ankles with their feet pointing up so that everybody's feet fits, you know, that the rope goes over their ankles and therefore over their feet. What I didn't anticipate was that I would have people in the room who couldn't get back up. I know that sounds silly, but I didn't think about the fact that some of my participants would have a hard time if they got down on the floor getting back up. And I had one person in particular who had a pretty hard time and, you know, she had a great time with the activity and everything, but we had to have like three people help her to stand back up. And I felt really bad about that because it embarrassed her. And, you know, sometimes you think it's, how could this possibly go wrong? <laughs> it can. So, just be careful with your activities, make sure that they're relevant, they're worthwhile, and that there's something that everybody's going to be able to participate in and not get you into trouble in another way. Details, details when you're designing, you got to think about all these details. Think about your room. How's the room going to be set up? You know, there are a lot of possibilities for room configurations. 
And even if you're doing this in a place where you're there all the time, this is your workspace, this is our conference room, this is how it's all is set up. It's funny because I've gone into organizations sometimes, gone into their conference room that they use every day and rearranged the chairs, rearranged the tables to, to do what I wanted to do with my activities and with my presentation. And people will walk in like they've never been in that room before in their lives. They'll be like, I didn't know the tables could move. You know, it's okay to like move the tables, move the chairs, you know, mix it up. Think about how it will best suit you because different formations of the room um, will create different experiences for you. You know, like if you want a whole lot of discussion, make it like, you know, make it into a U shape where everybody's kind of facing each other around the edges. That way that's going to allow them to look at each other as they're discussing. You know, if you want basic classroom style, you're going to be doing a lot of lecture. You know, so there are, are different things that you can do. When I show slides, I have tables pointing like this, you know, at each other so that there are people on both sides that can see in front of the room so that they can see the slides. So think about how your room is configured. Will you need a microphone? Big mistake that amateurs make is I don't need a microphone. You know, somebody will come in and say, do you want a microphone? Oh, I don't need a microphone. My voice projects great. If anyone ever offers you a microphone, Take it in a heartbeat because they're probably more knowledgeable than you knowing that this room has acoustical problems. And even for those of us who believe we can project our voices, there are a couple of things. One, as you talk and you go on in length, like even now, my voice is starting to sound a little raspy. You know, as you continue to talk, you, you stress your vocal cords and it becomes less easy for you to maintain that volume and, and make sure that everybody hears you. And the second thing is, is you never know really if you have someone in the room who may have an issue with being able to hear. And I've had that happen to me a couple of times and I, I really felt like I was disrespectful and it wasn't on purpose, but um, I, didn't, I didn't think about the fact that just because I thought I could project meant that everybody could hear. So, you know, if, if you have the ability to use a microphone and you think at all for any reason that you need it in the room, just use the microphone and make it easier on everybody. Uh, proximity to the restrooms, <laughs> proximity to the exits. What if there's an emergency? Uh, what about food? Well, there'll be food in the room. Or if they need a cup of coffee, where do they have to go to get a cup of coffee? Think about all of these, these little details in advance. It'll just make things go smoother for you. Logistics, verify the time and place. Oh, especially now with Zoom calls, the time zones, I get so mixed up. <laughs> I have to be really careful to make sure that I'm in the right time and place. So I've taken, taken to when I confirm that the time, I'll put Eastern time and then try to put it in their time zone too, which is uh, this time and central time, you know, to make sure that we're both on, on the same page with what time it's supposed to start. I put software on my list and the reason I put software on my list is because I've personally been burned a few times when the customer graciously offered me to use their equipment. They said, you know, use our computer. We have PowerPoint. We have a great computer. It's all hooked in. All you have to do is bring a, bring a flash, plug it in and everything will be fine. I bring my flash, I plug it in and then I find out as I'm presenting that they have a different version of PowerPoint than I created this presentation on. The animations aren't the same. Things aren't lining up the way I thought they would. And I'm thrown, which takes me off focus, which doesn't look good to my audience. So, you know, it's a whole thing. So even if you're using somebody else's equipment, you know, take time to check it out and make sure, you know, that you know what's going on with that. If you're using handouts, make sure they're they are in the room that you remembered them, that you have a, a idea for how you're going to pass them out, how that's going to handle your resources. Test everything. Test your projector. Look at your screen. Can you see the the stuff on the screen? You know, maybe you can run a couple of slides just to see if it's showing up okay. Is it crooked? Is everything all right? You know, get there in advance. Your flip chart, if you're going to use it, where do you place it in the room? Even your markers. You know how difficult it is to start writing with a marker and find out it doesn't work. Nobody can see it. There's no other markers anywhere in the universe at that moment. Of course. <laughs> so don't forget the details, details, details. All right. That brings us to the one you all want to hear about delivering your message tips for that. 
lots of tips for you on delivering the message. And the first tip is before the show, just give yourself a minute to prepare <laughs> mentally and physically. Ideas for how to do this. Well, there are, there are several ideas. There are some inside tips here that I'll, I'll tell you about. Some, th some things that maybe you don't think about or you know, maybe no one's ever told you. For example, you should be really careful not to drink carbonated beverages just before you go up to present. Carbonated beverages produce things that make us make sounds that don't sound good on a microphone. <laughs> um, you should take water to the podium. Um, lukewarm water or room temperature water. Cold water constricts the vocal cords. Not so good for you. Um, hot water is not so good for you either. Doesn't do good with your vocal cords. So lukewarm water is the best thing to, to start drinking before you present, keep you keep your throat moist. If you can play with the room temperature, if you have any control, 70 to 73 degrees is the sweet zone. If that's not cool enough for your participants to not freeze to death and cool enough for you to, that when you're up moving around the room, you're gonna, you're gonna produce a little more energy. Rehearse just prior. Um, I usually don't have time to rehearse the whole thing. So I always make it a point to reduce, just to rehearse my outline. What's my opening? What are my three main points? What's my close? Just say that in my head over and over just to make sure that I've, I've got that, that I, I know the order of my presentation and what I'm doing here. And, and then another thing you can do to really help is before you start, when your audience members start coming in, start connecting with them. As soon as they start coming in, if you can take some time, you know, to, hi, I'm Lorna, how are you? You know, I'm gonna be your facilitator today. How are you? What, what are you hoping to get out of today? Or what do you do? Whatever, try to connect with as many people as you can, meet as many people as you can, just talk with them. If you already know them, say hello, check in with them, because those all become your friends. They help, this helps reduce that nervousness that you have, because now, you know, you know some people, they're not all total strangers. In a way, and I don't know if I can make you believe this until you try it and you see, but in a way it makes you kind of, when you walk to the front of the room, you feel like you have some fans. <laughs> yeah, Cause you feel like they were, they felt like you were important enough to talk to them. And it just gives you a really good feeling like you, you're not in this alone, you know? So take some time to try to connect with people. I always try to get there really early before the first partic the participant ever comes in the room. Just so I can like take it in space, take some breaths, look around, feel comfortable in this space, you know, so that helps to lessen my nerves. And speaking of nerves, let's talk about some tips for losing those nerves. Okay, so the first thing is, I don't want you to think about what you're about to do in a presentation as a presentation. I just want you to think about having a conversation with the people in your audience. You're having a conversation. You'll hear me say over and over that when you present, your presentation should come from your heart and your expertise. I never try to memorize my presentation. I don't need to because I have the expertise and I want to talk to you from my heart. It's not just a bunch of words. Sometimes I'm going to stumble. That's okay. It makes me more human to you but I'm having a conversation with you. And this is why I really do like the live performing because I can have a conversation with my audience. On here, I'm having one with myself and pretending like you're playing with me anyway, except for a couple of you have kept your cameras on and that really helps me. Thank you for doing that because I can see you and I can see that you're with me and, and I appreciate it because that gives me energy. That gives you energy, you know, when you, when you see that going on in your audience. So don't think about it like I'm presenting stuff. You're having a conversation. You're going to put your main points out there. Your audience is going to be a part of that. So that really helps me with the nerves because I don't look at it as, you know, I'm a presenter up on a stage. I look at it as like, I'm going to go in and give my expertise on this. I'm going to talk to them about what I think about this, how I feel about this. I'm going to get their input. That's going to be fun. Yeah, I like it. Know your material. Know your material. There is, <laughs> Paula says, she's glad to see that it's okay to stumble. Of course, that's being human. People actually appreciate it when you're a little more vulnerable. I think they warm up to you when you, when you stumble and when you make a mistake now and then. So it's a good thing. 
you need to know your material. You have to be the expert. If you're not an expert, then you spend as much time as you need if you're forced to make this presentation to become an expert. Or your only other choice is to go in and say, I'm not an expert, but I'm being forced to do this. <laughs> you can't fake expertise. <laughs> you know, um, I have this kind of interesting thing going on right now because, you know, I do leadership and uh, leadership is a lot of topics. And one of my my customers asked me under the leadership realm to do a session on ethics. Well, I actually teach ethics as part of a management certification course that I do. It's not my favorite subject because I've never really studied ethics other than in a management realm. But I, I did the presentation for them and they referred me to someone who needed an ethics presentation. And now I'm getting several requests to do this ethics presentation and I feel a little uncomfortable because I can do it. It's just I don't feel like I have the depth of expertise. Like I don't have years of experience just, you know, analyzing ethics cases and that kind of thing. And it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. So when I do it, you know, I, I have to fess up to that. And I, I'm, I'm sure I'm doing a great job with it. It's just it doesn't come from that level of expertise that I'm comfortable with. You know what I mean? So I really think you have to speak from your expertise. You really have to know your material. You really have to know what you're talking about. When you know, when you're the expert, that makes it so much easier. <laughs> then you can just have a natural conversation and you can just talk about topics without having to be all caught up in, in reading your notes and, and knowing what you're supposed to say next because it comes from your heart, right? Be confident. And actually I should just say, be confident, Go back to what I just said and replay it, because if you know your stuff, if you are the expert, if you're speaking from your heart and from your expertise, you're going to be confident. If you're not confident, they're going to hunt you down like a dog. You're not going to make it. <laughs> Confidence may be something you have to fake until you can you know, feel really good about it, because you have to be confident when you stand in front of that audience. You're being asked to go in front of people and guide them through a process, guide them through a, some material. What a privilege. You go in with confidence because you've done your homework, you know your stuff, and you're ready to speak about it. So be confident, be authentic, be yourself. Don't try to be anybody else. I've seen some speakers who are pretty good actors and when they're up on the stage, they act one way and then they come off the stage and it's like, who are you? No. We don't want to do that. That's not being authentic. Just be you. You're the same person when you're on stage or when you're in front of an audience as you are when you're in the back of the room. Just be you. That's a really good person to be. So just be you. Don't don't try to copy somebody else's style. And then there's all the stuff that you know you should do before you present that will help you with your nerves that you have to be reminded of. So, you know, things like take deep breaths, Get a good night's sleep. Don't drink beforehand. <laughs> Don't take a, a, a you know a, one of those things that makes you go to sleep. A sedative. Don't do that. <laughs> or a nerve pill. You know. Don't do any of that stuff. Um, be careful with your food choices. You know. Uh, I'll sometimes when I you know I present for luncheon meetings and it's like oh here you can eat and then you can speak and it's like. I don't think so. You know, how about if I speak and then I'll eat? <laughs> it's like, ugh, that's the last thing I need. I, I have to be careful. That, that wouldn't be pretty. Plus, it, it takes all my energy is going towards digesting my food instead of, you know, giving my audience a great experience. So all that stuff that, you know, that you should do, yeah, do that. Um, if you're going to rehearse anything, it would be your open and close. Your open and close. Because those are probably the two most important of parts of your message, which takes me to the next thing, which is your open. Let's talk about your opening. Your opening is really important because you have this long to make me be interested in you. <laughs> so there are several ways that you can, can do your opening. Um, the first thing we have to realize is that we have to help our audience to shift focus as soon as we get started. You know, when you came here today, when you go to any presentation or speech or anything where somebody's going to be talking to you, you come in with a million things on your mind and it usually has nothing to do with the topic that you're about to hear about. 
So somehow as a presenter, I need to do something to get your attention and fast and get you on focus with what I'm about to talk about. So telling a story is, is a great idea. If I can get you in, involved in a story right away about something that happened to me, that's a very effective opener. I can use statistics. You know, when I started this presentation, I said, can you believe that 56% of the people surveyed said that, you know, they gave up a career opportunity? That's insane. And 90% are more afraid of this than death. So I use some statistics to try to get your attention. That's a good way. Sometimes um, something like imagine, imagine this, and then you present the problem and, and make a whole story out of it. Uh, that can be really effective. So think about how you're going to open. What you shouldn't open with is, Hi, I'm so glad to be with you today. <laughs> no, as soon as you're introduced, you need to jump right into your content. Leave all this stuff about, well, I'm Lorna and I have one child and two dogs. You know, put that in your intro. Have somebody else do that for you. Don't start with that. You start with your content. You got to get these people involved right away. You have to establish your credibility early. You know, you, I have to give you a reason to want to listen to me and to believe in my message and what I'm telling you. If I don't come across as credible to you, you've probably already left the meeting, <laughs> right? I have to have that credibility. I have to get your attention. And, and right away, I have to make my purpose known. You know, I have to tell you the reason we're here today and what you're going to learn. So all of that has to happen in the opening. All of that in the opening. The opening is very important. I, like I said, I don't typically memorize presentations or speeches, but I do try to memorize my opening and my close. And the reason for that is because those are the two most important things. And those are the two parts I don't want to mess up. If I can memorize it and be authentic at the same time, which, you know, it comes once you've memorized it, then you can speak to it and be authentic with it then I can do a great job with it. So if I'm gonna rehearse anything and I don't have time to rehearse the whole thing, I do my outline, open, my three main points, I close, and then I'll go back and start with the first few lines of my opening. You know why? Because that's where I'm the most nervous, right there at the opening. Once I get past that opening, the nerves just dissolve, you know? But am I nervous at first? Yeah, we're never gonna get completely rid of the nerves. As a matter of fact, a little bit of nerves are a good thing. But if I can just do that opening and nail that, okay, I'm ready. So the nerves just dissolve. So I, I think it's a good thing to really spend some time on trying to, to memorize that opening. You can use a rhetorical question. You could use a quote, uh, statistics, what if scenarios, um, an analogy, something that really draws your your listener in and, and gets them interested in you right away. Okay. All right. Let's talk about questions and answers. This is an important part uh, because questions and answers are part of almost every presentation and they're usually handled very poorly. Um, sometimes like with the zoom calls, I like to stop periodically and say, do we have anything, you know, before I transition to the next thing, do we have anything that I really need to answer? You know, I talked to Judy in advance and said, Judy, Paula, um, if anything comes up, signal me. It's okay to interrupt me. I would rather, you know, if there's a hot question that I need to answer right there, I'll answer it, you know, so I tell my producers how it is I, I want to handle it. During the presentation, that might be part of my transition. If I'm live, you know, before I move to point number two, I might stop and say, you know, what questions do you have? Or I might tell people, okay, let's hold questions till the end. Big mistake that we make is we close with question and answer. That's, that's a big mistake, you know, because here's what happens. All right, so we do our closing. Uh, what questions do you have? And, and notice that question. What questions do you have? It's not, do you have any questions? What questions do you have? Hear the difference? So what questions do you have? And, and usually the way I set this up is like this. When I'm there at that point, I'll say, all right, we're going to pause for Q&A. And when we're finished with that, I'm going to close. Ah. We're going to do Q&A. And when I'm finished with that, we're going to close. What questions do you have? See, if I close with the Q&A, you've been there, right? People start going, oh, we're done. It's time to go. 
they start messing around with their stuff, making a lot of background noise, praying that nobody has any questions <laughs> that they're going to ask, right? And of course, there's always that one person who's going to ask the question that I could care less about because it's time to go. You know, we're done. I'm packed up and I'm trying not to be rude, but really, I want to get out of that room. I, I'm not interested in their question, you know, right? That's what happens when you close with Q&A. It sets you up for a really bad thing. And I don't know about you, but I've been in presentations where it went on 10 minutes past time because somebody asked the stupidest question that I wasn't interested in, but I didn't want to be rude and leave. So I had to sit there and take it. And it, I left with just a bad feeling, left upset, left frustrated. That's not what we want our audience to leave with, right? So don't hold that Q&A until the very end, you know, do what I said, you know, all right, we're going to stop for Q&A and then I'm going to close. All right, so when a few more tips on handling questions and answers. Listen really attentive, really um, with attentively, that's a word. Uh, listen real attentively to the question because the first thing you're gonna have to do is repeat it back. You almost have to repeat the question back. Why? A couple things. Uh, probably, undoubtedly, there are people in the room who didn't hear the question, all right? They maybe tuned out for a minute, or maybe they just didn't legitimately hear it. So you've got to repeat the question back. The other thing is, is you might have to paraphrase the question because sometimes the question is long and so messed up that I still don't understand. So sometimes I'll need to say, let me make sure I understand your question. You'd like to know first, what are the three main tips for making great presentations? And second, which one do I think is most important? Did I get that right? So through that, I'm paraphrasing and I'm repeating back the question to make sure that I'm answering the right question. Because if you just dive in, you may answer the wrong question and all that time is wasted, right? Be concise in your answer. Don't stretch it out. You've already given your content. <laughs> if it has to be longer than just a, a few seconds, then you need to ask them to see you afterwards. Come and see me afterwards and we'll have more discussion about this. Here's the quick answer. If you want to talk more, come see me afterwards. We'll, we'll have a discussion. Value every participant. Even if somebody asks you a really stupid question, you know, you have to value it. And it's so off topic, right? Never let them take you off topic. Just say something like, that's a really interesting question. And even though I'm not really sure it relates to where we are right now, I'd like to think about that. Would you mind coming up afterwards? And let's talk about that some more. Chances are they're never gonna come up afterwards. But if they do, fine. At least you haven't disrupted the entire, the entire audience, the entire presentation. So just handle it like that. Um, if you don't know, you have to admit it. <laughs> I know it's uncomfortable. Uh, there's, there's two techniques you can use here if you don't know. The first thing is just to say, Wow, what a good question. I am not sure. I need to look at that and I want to do some research on that. Could you give me your card? Uh, drop it up, drop it on the table here after and afterwards I'll look that up and do some work on it and I'll get in touch with you. You know, just fess up. I mean, but, but let them know that good question, you know, I, I value that question, even though it's totally off base and it's nothing to do with anything, but yeah, I'll look it up anyway, you know, I'll Google it right after the session, you know, I'll say all that, that's what you're thinking, but, you know, just go ahead and, you know, admit that you, you don't know, you know, that's okay. Like I said, people want you to be human and you don't have to know everything. Chances are you're going to know a lot after doing your research. And if you know your stuff, you're going to know a lot, but every now and then I get stumped. A second technique, and this one is a little bit riskier, but kind of fun if you have the time to do it, is to say, that's a good question. I, I'm i wondering if anybody in the audience knows the answer and see what happens. Because sometimes there will be people out there, like I said, that know more than you and they'll have some answers and it'll start a really great discussion. And it's all about them, so yeah. So I've done that and had great success with it. Um, sometimes nobody will open their mouth, which probably means it was a stupid question. And many times the person who asked it gets that point and without you having to say anything. But either way, it's a win-win, right? So yeah, so those are the two ways I handle that. So those are some, some tips on 
and questions for you, how to handle Q&A. And your closing. Let's talk about your closing after you've done your Q&A. It's a lot like the open. You can use the same kind of things, but it's important that you kind of summarize with your closing, that you restate the main points. I mean, the, the whole idea here is for people to leave motivated and inspired by what they've heard. Motivated to take action. So we really want to do something in our clothes that gives people a sense of what to do next. You know, um, take some notes on the things that you're going to do. Like right now, if we were in person, I would be asking you, so what one thing did you learn that you are going to take action on as soon as we finish or for your next presentation? That's a good technique because that causes everybody to think about what we just learned and they summarize for you. That's a nice thing. Um, it's short and to the point, but things that work great stories, what if scenarios, blow me away statistics, all of those things that we talked about for the open work well for the close too. Remember that what we're doing in the close is kind of closing a loop that we started with the open. You know, we opened the presentation with something. We want to bring this whole thing to a close and the, the close needs to do that for your audience so that they feel like they've heard the whole thing. They've got the whole picture. You know, you don't want to leave them hanging here. So that's what the close is really all about. It's cool if you like return to your opening to close that loop. Like, you know, I told you these statistics at the beginning and at the end, like if I'm, I'm, maybe I'm talking about a problem scenario. Do you know how many people are killed by drunk drivers? And then I talk about a program that's doing something about it. Do you know how many lives have been saved in the close? Do you know how many lives have been saved because of this program? And here's how it changes the statistics those statistics or you tell a story at the beginning and don't give the close to the story and then save the close to the end. That's cool. So you're trying to close that entire loop with your closing and make sure that your audience feels satisfied. Like they've got the whole picture, the whole story there. That's, that's a good thing to do for your closing. Just a few tips for being in front of the room. Use the entire room. Uh, as much as you can. I get I get um, a little frustrated when presenters don't move at all. You know, they stay in the same spot, especially when they're standing in front of the screen so that I can't see the slides. <laughs> move around, you know, be natural. I try to move uh, sometimes towards the back of the room just to, to check on the people in the back of the room while I'm speaking. So be natural move around, you know, watch your posture, watch your nonverbals because they're reading your nonverbals as we do when we're communicating. Just be you, you know, eye contact. Eye contact is really important. And you've probably heard that one good way to handle eye contact is just to, uh, you know, look over the heads of your audience. If you can't look at people, just look over their heads so that, you know, it looks like you're looking at somebody out there. That's bull. People know exactly what you're doing. I mean, come on. These are your friends. You met them beforehand, you know, you connected with some people. So just go around and, and make eye contact with a few people. Read their faces. Honestly, it gives you so much energy when you make eye contact with somebody and you can see they're totally with you. It gives you energy and enthusiasm and really helps to make your presentation more authentic. So don't be afraid, you know, to make eye contact with people. Instead of making you more nervous, you'll find that it comforts you. And use silence when you're up there. Um, we talk way too fast usually when we're doing a presentation. We need to slow down. We need to know that there are going to be some moments of silence. You know, what's really fun is you're talking, you're on a roll, and then you just stop talking and see how people react. <laughs> people who weren't paying attention are all of a sudden like, what's happening? What's going on? <laughs> so using silence is, is kind of a secret, uh, secret weapon of mine that I use sometimes. Um, just make sure that people can hear you, you know, check in every now and then. Hey, can you guys hear me? Oh, there he is. Everything okay that they, they can hear you because like I said, you, I hate going through it. That's one of the things I hate the most is like I go through the whole thing and then somebody comes up afterwards and says, you know, I couldn't hear you the entire time. And I'm like, why are you telling me now? <laughs> but I've learned to try to check in a couple of times to, to make sure that people can hear and that they're doing okay. So I'll stop every now and then and just say, hey, is this going all right? Are you hearing me? Are you feeling this? You know, how, how are you doing? And just check in. And sometimes I get a surprise when I do that. Like, we're sweating to death in the back of the room. 
okay, cool. I need to try to do something about that because that's distracting them from hearing the presentation and from participating. So that's cool. So I, I try to check in with people depending on how long the presentation is. And when it's done, there's still more to do, you know, <laughs> it's not done. You need to take time to reflect on what happened. And as soon as I can, I, like right after this presentation today, I'll be going back into my presentation and making notes on parts that went smoothly and parts where I thought I stumbled on parts that I think I, I need to do differently so that the next time I do this presentation, it'll be even better. You know, so right away, I'm going to go back and go, go over this. If I have participants that I'm making a plan for following up with them, I'm offering them a way to follow up with me. Um, and, uh, you know, anybody that missed the presentation that needed to be there, seeing what I can do to connect them. So don't just, you know, walk away and say, well, that's done. Whew, you know, <laughs> you got to think about what's going to happen next. All right, we got five minutes to go and I'm going to pause to ask for questions and then I will close. So what questions do you have? Do we have questions? Uh, first of all, yes, I guess we do have maybe a couple of questions. Um, and I want to thank you. I don't know if you know this about me, Lorna, but I actually have quite the career in audiovisual. You do not know how desperately needed the information you just gave is to many <laughs> of the speakers I've had in the past. Because it, it's so you're dead on whether it's slide presentations and the size of the fonts all the way down to just use a microphone, please. <laughs> so thank you so much for making that for anybody who's doing it. I want to make sure that also we realize that when we're talking about these presentations and all this information, small business owners may not actually realize that this same uh, information can be exactly as effective in a small room if you're trying to make a deal with another uh, company, for example, or you're trying to gain new business, or you're just teaching your your own processes and procedures internally, all of that information that you just gave us today is absolutely gold, and I want to thank you for it. Just period. And uh, let's see. Now we'll go to some questions real quick. <clears throat> let's see here. One of them is uh, actually making a comment here. They were in a meeting yesterday uh, where the speakers looked at them directly in the eyes and that person felt obligated to pay attention after that. <laughs> so, and I, I, I also agree with that. I, I think uh, looking people directly in the eyes, that's like lightning, you know, they're going to look at you and, and pay attention. Yeah, but, but bro, you know, what happens is it's like, you're talking to me. Well, that, that's powerful. Right. Yeah. Right. And I don't know if, if there aren't, there aren't very many questions right now, but while people are getting uh, in there to try to get them. I just want to say that every time you speak, you're so concise and you drive the information so well, it's hard to come up with questions because you've answered most of them by now. So um, if anybody does have a question, please go ahead and put it in there. I don't see any at the moment, Lorna. So All right. We'll continue, we'll continue on. All right. And Brett, you know, as I said, if anyone has questions that they think of afterwards, my contact information is available. I'm perfectly fine with you sending me an email and we can talk afterwards. So thank you. Um, great, but great. honestly, the goal for making a great presentation is to get to this point where we have three minutes left and people are so well informed that they don't have a lot of questions, then we've done well. Because honestly, if the board was lighting up right now with questions, I'd be freaking out because we only have three minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so these are our three steps as we bring it to a close. Developing your content, designing your presentation, delivering your message. All three are important. We focus so much on the delivery that we forget that if we do those first two steps, the delivery is going to be so much easier. <laughs> know your stuff, be the expert, speak from the heart. So imagine this, here you are, you're making your next presentation. You have no fear, a little nervous, but hey, you know, that's going to go away. You're well-prepared, you're confident, you're ready, ready to have a conversation with your audience and to focus on their experience, not yours. Nerves under control, not gone. They're always gonna be there a little bit, right? Okay, but when you stand in front of the audience, you're feeling honored to be where you are 
and the position that you are in that moment. And you recognize that this is really a privilege, a privilege to be the person leading this group through this important discussion. And as soon as you realize that, your nerves dissolve and you rock it, you rock it. And you can't wait to do it again. Good luck with future presentations. If you need me, you know how to reach me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lona. That was a great close. I have a question uh, just for everybody here. Uh, if you do want a copy of the presentation or you have more questions, there's going to be a survey coming out. Uh, and if you would just fill it out, it'll take two minutes. We'll get, we'll be happy to put you in touch. You can always find Ms. Gibby uh, Leadership Solutions there. You want to tell us your website real quick? www.l. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you told me to stop sharing. <laughs> no, 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 no. I just wanted to see that last slide, but that's okay. I got you. Um, there you go. You got it back? I think it's coming back now. Yes. It is World Wide Web, lkibby at uh, lkibby.com, right? That's my email address. Yep, lkibby at lkibby.com. Drop me a line. Let me know how I can help. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We do really appreciate it. And thank you so much for all the things that you do. Now I'll take control of that and uh, tell everybody that we have as well more wonderful uh, presentations coming up. I hope to utilize a lot of the information that she gave today by trying to get through this next part quickly to get everybody out as close to on time as possible. And just to let you know, coming up on May 26th, we have go up co, uh, co a petition. I cannot even say that, but Mark Wilson can. And he'll be presenting it May 27th. We have naming, niching, and branding with Jamie Ethrop, uh, Elithrop. And May 27th, we have meetings, how to make them short, sweet, and effective. That one is going to be presented by Lorna Kibbe, too. I can't wait to see these two, how they combine together. It's going to be amazing. So please go to our website at the SBDC to find out more information about all the upcoming uh, training and other sources. If you do need to get in touch with a small business uh, advisor, you can reach them as well on our website. We do want to thank a few people, of course, that make this funding possible and make all of these presentations possible. One Smith. We want to thank the Small Business Administration, the State of Texas, North Texas SBDC Regional Office, as well as North Central Texas College. Without them, we couldn't make this happen. So we very much appreciate them. And we thank all of you for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you next time. This gets us as close to the end on time as possible. Everybody have an absolutely amazing rest of the week.